All right. All right. Well, as we take this opportunity to, to give our praise and worship to the Lord, let us take a moment and pray. The glorious King of Heaven, as we come to worship, we gather before your throne. And so we pray that you help us to have hearts that are full of awe and reverence for you, the way that you deserve. Make what we do in this time and in this space a delight and an honor for you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's begin with some singing. Uh, do, do people have songs they would like us to sing this evening? What do you have, Justin? Uh, 557. 557? Five fifty seven, my Jesus, I love thee. All right. And then why don't we why don't we stand? My Jesus, I love thee, I know. Jesus, my Lord, up from 
cheat sheet right there. It has verses that are below it that um, are, are useful when you're studying and trying to find biblical truths. But if you, if you don't have a specific verse off the top of your head, but you, you have the truth of God that, that you've summarized in your own word that you want to share, that's also permissible. So John, did I say you have something? Well, first of all, that life is eternal. Yes. Yeah, life is eternal. And uh, we have eternal life, and uh, it says I'm hid in life and in death. So yeah. Death. Yeah, there is something that comes next. Yeah. And so, what we do is not just about the here and now. That's an important truth. What are, what are the truths from the Bible that we see in Lord's Day 1? Or perhaps I, I'll start by, uh, by reading. Um, I'll, I'll read the questions, and then we'll say the answers together. Okay. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Question two, what must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? Three things. First, how great my sin and misery are. Second, how am I set free from all my sins and misery? Third, how am I going to thank God for such a deliverance? Okay. So, what else from question and answer one and two stands out to you? Because this is meant to be a summary of, of the Word of God. What, what good things about the Word of God do we see in these answers? 
Russ? Yeah, you see the, uh, the uh, Trinity in uh, question and answer, or in answer one? Yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, you're right. We see the, the work of the Father in heaven. We see the, our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, and the assurance that comes through his Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's a good point. John? Um, that I'm forever indebted to yeah. Jesus for the price that he pays. Yeah, how, how does that sound, to be forever indebted? Uh, in this case, pretty good, because <laughs> <laughs> oh, what I got from him is uh -huh. it's, it's priceless, so, yeah. Yeah, but that, that is, it's a crazy concept, though, to think about that. It's not that we're set free and then just sent off roaming to do our own thing. Mm -hmm. That we are set free to become <clears throat> slaves of Christ. You know, depending on the version of the Bible that you have, some, you know, some, some versions will say slaves, some will say bond servants. It's just a nicer way of saying slave, but you know, this idea that, that we belong to God. You know, where, where else do we get... I like the, servants because... Also, there's no longer slave nor free. So well, that's so that's true. Yeah. Christ, but we're all servants for sure. Yeah. Slavery has such a negative connotation, you know. It does. <laughs> no, what are you talking about, John? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's one of these these things that we see like when we look at, at scripture. That yeah, when we there, there's something in me that, that likes to use the more sensational language because it gra grabs people's attention, but you know, the, the idea that you know, slavery in almost every instance ended up being wrong because we as people do not make good slave owners, but we see that God who rightfully owns all things and who is merciful, kind, and just. You know, that, that's where, uh, yeah, because what I, what I think of is is Romans chapter 6, where, yeah, it's, depending on, on the passage that you go to, some, some passages make it clear that we are set free from slavery, but, uh, but Romans chapter 6, I guess the main, go ahead. That's good. So, so Romans chapter 6, starting with verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you, you have come to obey, let's see, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And so, yeah, like, it's, it's in context of, like, it's not the same slavery, but it's... But it's, it's uh, it does hit on what I was going to say, what it says when you offer yourself as a slave. Right? Yes. So we're no longer slaves uh, by force, but True. willingly we enter ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah as, as the... It's the to do, Romans 12, 1 or 2, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, that is a good distinction. You're, you're right, that it's, it's not a, uh, a forced slavery, that, that it is the kind of slavery that we usually think of mm -hmm. and that we rightfully you know, de detest. But, the, uh, but it's, it's one of these things, when you come back and you look at the Old Testament language of slavery, um, there's, there's more than one kind of, of slavery. There is some of that slavery that is done because of of people wrongfully capturing and forcing people into, into slavery, but then you also do see there's that tradition of, of when somebody is, is financially in a place that they cannot dig themselves out of a hole. They work themselves into a position where the debt that they're in is so great that they'll, they'll never be able to, to be set free. And so what you do then is you would, you would turn to your, your closest of kin that is able to to redeem you, and so it's, it's this language of the kinsman redeemer, and we see it being used with the, the story of, of Ruth and Boaz, but you would, you would have, you know, the, the, net, the closest of kin that is able to, to redeem you is, is called your kinsman redeemer, and that they would pay that price for you, um, but then you would end up serving them, and, you know, 
being as if you were, you know, it's, it's, it's the same language of, of slavery that, you know, you would serve that, that person who has, has set you free. Yeah. But, it's, but it's, it's this idea that, you know, it's we, when we offer ourselves to Jesus Christ, we're willingly acknowledging that we, because of our sin, have set up a debt that is so great that we would never be able to pay it. And then we look to Jesus Christ, who became fully human, so he is our next closest of kin, who is able to pay that price. And that, you know, now that he's paid that debt for us, you know, we, we rightfully belong to him. Now, fortunately, he's a benevolent and, and merciful master. But, yeah, it's that, that idea that, yeah, the, uh, one, of, one of the notes that I, I had put down, I'm just thinking about, um, yeah, I think where, where I have it. Yeah, so, so part of, you know, why is this answering, honoring to, to Jesus slash God? I put, it's, it's not really a sacrifice when we give everything we, we have and are to God as much as it is a returning to God what belongs to Him. You know, because it's, it's the idea of like when people say like when you're tithing and you're giving your money to God, it's really just more of giving Him back what what really is His, recognizing that everything that we have belongs to the to the Lord. Mm-hmm. But it's just putting it back in the, the hands of the one um, who, who made all things. But, yeah. Even if we offer ourselves as slaves, uh, when you read down here, it's only by the Holy Spirit, that He makes us willing and ready to live for Him. Amen. So that isn't even anything we do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that's, I would agree with that. And that's, that's something that I have for like that, that fourth question of, you know, what, what else would you, would you like to hear more about? And I have is, is how can we become more and more willing to serve, to serve God, because, you know, it's just that idea of, you know, by, by His Holy Spirit, it assures me of eternal life, and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him, and just realizing that, like, like that's true, I acknowledge what, what you're saying, that, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, He's the one that makes that possible, and yet, I'm not as willing as I would like to be, and so it's just that, that you know, that prayer of, like, Lord, you're like, Make me more, make me even more and more willing. I don't have to wrestle with, with the temptations and the, and the, the struggles of this, this world. That, um, yeah. But it says, wholeheartedly, willing and ready, from now on to live for Him. Yeah, Kathy? One thing that struck us as we were going through this was um, that all things work together for our salvation. Puts a whole different spin on it than work together for our good. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense, work together for our good, but I never put the word salvation in there. Yeah. So often we think of it as... Our good. As yeah. working together for our pleasure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. That, that it's all going to work together for our happiness or pleasure, you know. Yeah. But our good is our salvation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Lou, do you have something to say on that? Yeah, it was the stuff that was before that 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 I thought was real comforting is the part that it says that he watches over me in such a way that not only the hair come off my head and that without the will of my Father in heaven, almost like what you were talking about this morning, all those all those trials, all those different things, he watches over all that, even during all those times, that all those little trials, he sees every single one of them. Yeah. All like you said this morning, that all those big things all, to us are big things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, those all those trials and everything. But they're all done in such a way that that strengthens our faith, it strengthens everything. But it's all done in such a way that we must work together for our salvation. And and when you read it here, it says it works together for our salvation. Yeah. Yes. And I thought that's I mean He's watching over every bit of it, even that one little hair that falls out of your head. Yeah. And there's a lot of them that keep falling out of my head every day. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd say that the, uh, yeah, yeah. I, t- 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 tomorrow I turn, I turn 39, so I'm almost at 40, and I'm noticing, getting that, like, receding, 
Caroline, and so. We sing happy birthday. Yes, yes, yes we do. do. Now that's, <laughs> you, thank you for picking up. I was really just trying to dig for a you know, <laughs> there. You know. it's, it's the humble yeah. brag. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they, but yeah, the, just that idea. Like if, if he knows, you know, every time a, a hair falls from our head, if he knows what's going on with the sparrows and the flowers and everything, then how can God not know the, the sufferings that, that we're going through and those difficulties? Like, he knows. He knows everything that is going on. And yet, you know, I, I like that, that, you know, that, that distinction you're making that where, where Romans chapter 8, you know, it, verse uh, 28 says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and have been called according to his purpose. It is interesting how, for the Heidelberg Catechism, um, they, they fill that in specifically. Like It's not saying that that verse is wrong, but it's saying, in this context, what is this greatest good that we're, we're holding on to? Salvation. And, it, and, it, and Don, I think your, your point was excellent. Of, you know, when we think of uh, good, we usually think of like nice and happy and pleasant. Like you know, it's, it's pleasing to us, and yet when we're going through those hard times, those hard times themselves aren't pleasing. And so I, sometimes I've, I've heard people misunderstand what Romans chapter 8 is saying. That it's like, you're supposed to enjoy everything. Like, no, no, like that's not what it's saying. It's like, it's, he, God's going to take everything, even the things that are not pleasing, and he's going to work them together so that in the end, what we have is a good. And what is that good? Like, Kathy, you're saying that it's salvation. It's salvation. It's not, I don't, I don't think it's, it's, the only good, not that's what, you, that, that's what you were saying, but just understanding that, you know, when that good has been accomplished for us, you know, what, what else could be taken from us? When we have the salvation of our souls and when we have the redemption of our bodies, what kind of power does sin really have over us at that point? It doesn't really have a lot of room. Because it can, it can cause temporary temporary grief in this life. But even that's going to be temporary compared to the, the eternity that we're going to be living with, with God. It assures me of eternal life. What else do you guys see? What, what else about the, the Bible is highlighted in this question and answer? Um. I would say that it does speak somewhat of uh, God's sovereignty. Yeah. It says here we're set free from the tyranny of the devil. Yeah. Like we were a slave to him for sure. And that wasn't a pleasant time. <laughs> no, no. And, uh, but uh, through Christ's victory uh, and his sovereignty, he, was, he you know, took us back. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that is good news there. Very good news. That's what I see. The, yeah, I, I think a lot of what we're seeing in, in our country right now is, is the result of when we as, as a culture are moving further and further away from the Bible. And, and you see the tyranny that comes as, as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And then you just think of, you know, when the devil gets his way and <laughs> you don't have the church to, to hold him back, just imagine what that tyranny looks like, and yet we who are believers were set free from that. You know, that, that, that kind of... Because it, it's one of the things that... like you know, There's so many different things that are going on in the news, and, and there's so many reasons for grieving in, in all different directions we're looking at. And, and so many people I've talked to, it's that question of like, how, how could people think that way? Why, why would somebody think this is right? Or, or like, what... what, what where are people getting these ideas from? And I, I believe it's, you know, it's, it's the tyranny of the devil. That when, when we are slaves to sin, you know, what, what is wisdom to God seems foolish to us. And what is foolishness according to the righteousness of God begins to look like wisdom. And, uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, just that tyranny of the devil. And that I'm, I'm very thankful to be set free from it, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot that I have to do in the journey of understanding the wisdom of God, but that being set free so I don't have to continue to live in foolish and dark ways. So. Mm -hmm. and one, 
one of the, the verses that, that came to my mind while studying it is, is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. This is the Apostle Paul. He says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient, sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I just like that idea of, you know, when Jesus Christ is our Savior, every day and moment that we have in this world is an opportunity to serve Him and to, to make His redemptive glory known in this world. But the, what is the worst thing that Satan could do to us? What is the worst thing that could happen to us if, if, you know, in this life? Is that this life would be taken away from us. <coughs> but even if this life is taken away from us, what do we receive? We receive new life in Jesus Christ. We get to be in His presence. We get to delight in His glory. And so it just shows us you know, the power of sin. The power of Satan is so small. When you, when you take the biggest, largest tool out of his toolbox, and you turn it into a thing of, of glory, <laughs> what else does he have? There's, yeah, there's temporary griefs and pains that we go through. I don't want to undermine that, but it, as we were saying this morning, it's going to seem <clears throat> so small in comparison to the joys that we're going to receive in, in spite of it. So what are some... Uh, well, yeah, so I guess the question... Will, why would we see this, this Lord's Day uh, being honoring to Jesus our God? If, if we had a chance to sit down with, with Jesus, why do you think Jesus would say, yes? Well, we ascribe to him uh, all the glory in every one of these answers. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, no, you're right. And then tying that into what you were saying, Russ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are, are all there. You see, you know, God is the one who's receiving the, the glory. So mm -hmm. that's good. Thanks, John. It's all, it's all based on God's own words. Uh, it's all based on his what? God's own words. <clears throat> yeah, it's based on his yeah. words. It's all, it's all based on Scripture, which is God's words. So. Yep. That's one of the things that I do love about the Heidelberg Catechism is that, yeah, they'll, they'll put in connecting words and this and that, but they use so much of scripture it's, itself to, to create those answers. What else do, you, do we see about this Lord's Day that, that's pleasing to, to Jesus or God? I think I, sorry, um, the, the wholeheartedly willing and ready to live for him, I think that he'd be very pleased with that because we can't, you know, there's no path following him. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. It's not the uh, well. Let's see. You know, the I'll I'll serve him on the on Sundays and then every odd day. The evens those are for me. Like, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. It's wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. So Joyce, were you about to say, or Jolene? Yeah. I I love that part when it says how Christ it's by the Holy Spirit that He assures me of my eternal life. And yeah. I think a lot of believers look for an assurance and they're not quite there yet. Yeah. But that is the biggest blessing of all. Yeah. To have that assurance. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, the reality is that, you know, we, we, we have doubts. People have questions. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's an understandable part. But, you know, the, the doubt is not because the Word of God does not have the answers for us. And so there you're saying, it's like, Jesus Christ, you know, he's, he's died for us. He's, he paid that, that price. That's one of the things that I love. It's like, he has fully paid for all of my sins with his precious blood. Like, you know, the prices are already been paid. And so what, what, what reason do we have left to, to doubt and to be able to have that, that confidence that Jesus Christ has made this, this possible? And we don't have to worry about our salvation. And yes. We have this hope to get there. We can know right now by the Spirit within our heart that, that we have that and can have that confidence. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it breaks my heart to, to see people who, 
who go to church for years and still struggle with with doubts. <laughs> and uh, one of the uh, one of the classic stories is William Cooper, who who's written a lot of the the, the classic Puritan hymns. Uh, he was someone that struggled with depression his whole life, and and he believed in the sovereignty of God. He believed that you know that God would elect people, he would, he would rescue people, and he just believed, because of his depression, that he was not one of the elect, and you know, he went his, his whole life struggling with that, and it's like, that, that's, that's heartbreaking, and yet, you know, like you're, you're saying, that, that the word of God does not give us the reason, does not give us the room for that, that kind of doubt, and to have the, that peace, that assurance that comes from the victory of Jesus Christ. That's powerful, and, and there's you know, there's no other religion that's going to be able to, to offer that kind of promise because every other religion you're going to have to follow these rules, and you're constantly going to be asking, "Have I done enough?" The, uh, I'm, I'm curious. Has has anyone watched the television show The Good Place? The, uh, no, it's okay. It's uh, it's 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 a it's a, it's a really interesting television show where it's a comedy, but they're they're trying to to look at this idea of morality, and, and it's, they, they try to blend all the religions together, so it's not specifically talking about Christianity and heaven and hell, but, but you get these themes of, can we do enough good stuff in this world to be saved? And, and they realize that there's a flaw with that reasoning, that, that any of us could be saved and rescued because of the good things that we do, because any of the good things that we try to do to, in order to earn our place in, you know, in, in heaven or in the new paradise, is actually a selfish motive, right? Because if you want to do a good thing, so you can end your life and say, I did it, look at all these great things I did. Well, then they're not good, they're selfish things. And so like, it's just this whole idea that like, we in our own strength and power, like, no matter what we do, we end up failing and we end up making things worse. So, like, we cannot be good people, and yet this is what the religions of the world, their system is... If you do enough good things that it outweighs the bad things that you've done, and you do this calculation in the end, maybe, just maybe, you've made it. And that would be scary. And yet, like you're saying, we don't have to worry about that. Jesus Christ, he's the one who paid the debt of our sins. He's the one who gives us the assurance of our salvation. John? Now that's how it is here. What kind of work catechism and the reform and all that. Yeah. The church I was saved in, it was a Pentecostal church, and God bless them. They had a lot of a lot of stuff right. Yeah, you know, definitely uh, let the Holy Spirit move. But somehow they missed out a lot on grace, and there was yeah uh, always this threat hanging over you. Uh, if you don't, if you if you were to sin, and then before you could repent, you died. You'd go to hell. Yeah, you know, it was literally. Oh yeah, it became known as the revolving door theology. You know, uh huh. Like, you're here, you're here, you never, you never really did. So it was like always praying through. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, in that church, yeah, you, you did have to worry. Yeah. <laughs> but that that worry was not put there. Oh God, you know, thank God for I'm free from that. I don't yeah. know where it happened along the line, but one day I realized it was like. I can't do it by myself. I'm always going to be sinning, you know? Uh huh. One of these days I want to sin, and I'm going to die too, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like that's that's the that I, I've known a lot of people who I, I totally respect their 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 love and their devotion to Jesus, and yet they still have this what I believe is a flawed idea of of our salvation, and it's yeah. it's sad to think that they they hold open this possibility that say you could go your whole life, just go decades with devoting yourself to, to Jesus and making smart choices, but if you. You know, let's say you know a piano is falling from you know a tower, and you look up and you say a swear word because you know what's about to happen. You know that swear word is just gonna just completely undo everything that you had lived up to until that moment. It's like, just like you know, how how frightening is that kind of an idea? Or uh, or or even in a, in a in in a less humorous way, you know, if you think of. How often as we get older in our mental capacities as, as those change and and to think that you know that my salvation could could be lost because 
of me getting older and my mental capacity is being taken from me and so I don't know how to under really understand or explain the cross of Jesus Christ? That's a horrifying idea if you've lived your, your whole life. And then that would be the end result. And yet, that's not what we believe according to, to the Word of God. So, yeah, I mean, so I think what we're talking about right now is, is, is a, a great answer for that third question of which real world problems are held by this, this answer. We don't have to, <clears throat> to be living under a constant fear that we are not good enough because we're given the answer that says, you're right, you aren't good enough. <laughs> But that's not why you're saved. That's not why you're rescued. Because Jesus is good enough. Because Jesus is good enough. Amen. So, what what other real world problems can you can you think of that that are uh, that we're comforted in as we look at this Lord's Day? Hopelessness. Yeah, I agree with you. But explain. <clears throat> well, you can. If you don't have the Lord and. The things that are going on today, it, it, I mean, it's very evident today that a lot of people just, they have no hope because they don't have Jesus. Yeah. And they think they're going to find it in this or that piece of justice or what have you, or burning down the next door, or looting the next, you know, whatever. And they don't find that. They just continually don't find it because they have no hope. They think they will find what they're looking for, but they, they can't find it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you think of, of all these different things that people are, are looking to. Um, you yeah, know, one, one of the things I was, I was the habit is that um, when we have Jesus Christ, we don't have to, to hide in fear. And that hiding in fear is, is kind of like when you're, that hopelessness. We don't have to tr try to, to, to forget about our hopelessness by doing things like drugs or alcohol or pornography or gambling or shopping or you think of all these different kinds of addictions that, that we turn to. Like in our human nature, we, we are unbelievably good at taking the good things of God and making them become bad by worshiping them as, as idols. And yet, you know, like we, we pursue these things so that way we don't have to think about our hopelessness. And yet when we have our hope in Jesus Christ, we don't have to be filled with with fear and shame and regret. And uh, so one of the other things I was thinking of as a benefit of, of this Lord's Day is, is that we don't have to live in shame and regret because it says that Jesus Christ has fully paid for all of my sins with his precious blood. And uh, it's when, when I was leading a, a support group for our men who are struggling with sexual addictions, you know, just that, that idea of, you know, what. Well, Shame is, is that power that keeps us in addiction. Because when we do something that we know that's wrong, then we're filled with a sense of, of shame. And then when we're filled with a sense of shame, we feel worthless. And when we feel worthless, we look for something to try to numb that shame. And so it's one of these things that, like I said, you know, on, that, on that list of, of addictions that people look to. And so when you have somebody that is caught in a cycle of, of addiction, when you can break that cycle of shame that tells someone that, you know, that they'll never be loved, that they'll never be valuable. And you can break that by saying, well, you're right, you will never make yourself to be loved or valuable, but Jesus Christ has loved you anyways. You are loved because he says that you are loved. You do not have shame because he has paid that debt of your guilt. He himself has wiped that away. So you are valuable because he has made you valuable. That is a powerful truth that helps to break that power of addiction. And one of the things I would often say to the, those guys there is, is um, have you guys ever seen like those antique road shows like on television or, or in person? Yeah, so this idea where you, you're, you're going to bring something to, to someone who who really knows their, you know, their, their historical artifacts. And, and maybe you have something that's just a piece of junk, or maybe you have something that is very valuable. And you, know, you might have something that most people would look at and say, oh, that's, that's only worth $10, $10. But maybe you bring it to one of these appraisers, and they look at it, and they say, that's worth $10,000. And then you've got somebody over here who says, I want that. I need that vase. I need that lamp. That whatever it is, and they pay that ten thousand dollars. 
Now, how much is that, is that item worth? Well, it's worth 10000 Why? Because somebody paid 10000 for it. It before, it was only worth $10 because someone would only pay $10 for it. But when somebody was willing to pay 10000 for it, it now has a value of $10,000. And now you think about the fact that Jesus Christ has died on the cross and he has paid with his own precious blood to pay for our sins, to pay for our lives. And what's the value of the blood of Christ? That's infinite, right? But there's nothing more valuable than the blood of the Son of God. And yet he paid that price for us. And so if Jesus was willing to pay that price for us, what's now our worth and our value? We have the worth and the value of Jesus Christ himself. We are made heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. And that, that is our worth right there. It's a hard one to, to get a hold of, kind of like, I'm not worth that. Much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You wake up and you look in the mirror and go, oh, no, no maybe not today. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it's that, that idea that when we feel like We'll never be loved. We'll never be valuable. And Jesus says, dude, like, I already have loved you. I have already made you powerful. When I died on the cross, I already made this happen. So don't, don't doubt. Don't fear. You're loved. And then that, that fourth question, I'm curious, does, does anyone have something that, you know, is, is sparked in their minds by this Lord's Day that, you know, they, they'd be interested in, in hearing more about. I think that term, living for him. Yeah. That is a huge, huge term. Yes. That involves everything we do, how we treat our neighbor. Yeah. How we drive our cars. Yeah. Do we go the speed limit? Do we stop for stop signs? Uh -huh. Do we do the best at our jobs? And, yeah. you know, somebody cuts us off, do you cuss at them, or do you smile away at yeah. them? <laughs> yeah. That's all involved. That's a huge, huge statement. Yeah. I mean, for him. It's yeah. more than just coming to church or something. Oh, you are right. You are right. And there is so much that is packed into that phrase right there. <laughs> what does it mean to live for Jesus? I mean, isn't that so much of what we gather for every week to, to help understand better and better what it means to live for Jesus? I had a lady get very nasty me this week because I, I'm, I'm delivering some food for the Arlington Food Bank. Anyway, I back into this driveway and she comes screaming at me, you can't park here, i got to get out of here, I'm in a hurry. And she oh. was nasty. Oh. So I went ahead and moved the truck over, carried the food in, I still beat her out of the driveway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. It's everything. It's everything to live for him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that is a... Yeah, that is a good phrase to pull out there. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> Any other things that... Okay, this doesn't... I'm, that's not exactly on line with today, but it's that's very on line with what he said. Yeah. And that is something I've been thinking about off and on more lately. Where he talks about what Jesus himself said to uh, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. Yeah. I... That's a mystery to me. <laughs> I'm not having a clue really. It's like... Okay, you do good deeds or something, or you witness, or you know, you give offerings. I don't know, but I mean, it seems like it has to be more than that. It's like, you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like you can put money in the bank, you know, it's there, and you know, you, I don't know, but how, how do you know if you lay a purpose in heaven, you know? Yeah. You no, know, that's, that's another good question. So <laughs> it's just that idea. Yeah, like I said, it ties in very well with that idea of living for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, uh, thank you for this conversation. I've enjoyed this. Let me close our, our discussion with some prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your wonderful mercies that, you, that you've loved us, that you've redeemed us, and you've, you've shared with us your own glory. We, we humbly admit tonight that that is definitely not something that we have earned or deserved. So help us in our worship, to honor you well, to give you praise, so that, so that way is people who look at us in the way that we live our lives, that they would better know 
the truth that we celebrate this evening. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, if you would grab a, your great Psalter hymnals and turn to page 813, uh, we will affirm our faith tonight using the words of the Apostles' Creed. So that is 813. So if you would be willing to, to stand as we renew our faith through these words, I want to say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, as we go, we go with this blessing from Romans 15 that says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us go in this peace. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Kyle, happy birthday to you. Well, thank you very much, I do appreciate that. Bring out the cake. Yeah, we're just <laughs> No, we already, we already ate some of the cake. Be careful, careful. No, no, don't do that.